Welcome to this uh, Create Public Lecture uh, as part of our March uh, series of events, which this year is on the theme of openness, IP, and innovation. Our guest speaker today, we're really excited to welcome Dr. Rufus Pollack. Dr. Rufus Pollack is a, an activist, scholar, and policy advisor, and one of the founding or founders of Open Knowledge, which is, a, um, which is an international nonprofit. And their uh, mission statement, which I find really, really, really nice and really interesting, is uh, empowering people to understand and improve the things they really care about. And I just think that's a really nice mission statement. And I'm really interested to learn more about how you accomplish that uh, in your various open data initiatives, which you're going to, to discuss today. So um, thank you all very much. And um, welcome to, uh, to Rufus. Thank you. Um, well, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here uh, uh, on this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk about making an open information age. And um, I am going to really talk at quite a kind of high level and about the vision we have for that. And I just to say a little bit about me at the very beginning, um, maybe we have it here, which is, I'm, I'm both the founder uh, and the president of Open Knowledge. I now no longer Open Knowledge kind of International, which is a non, kind of global nonprofit that works, uh, as uh, Christopher just said, to open up information, open up public interest in information, and see it used and useful. See it used to make a difference to things people really care about. That could be their commute to work. It could be where, what school should they send their kids to. It should be, is this drug that I, might, I could be prescribed, is it good for me? What are the side effects? Um, it could be, where does my money go as a taxpayer? But to understand and make a difference of things people really care about. And I'm also an associate at the Centre for Intellectual Property and Information Law. And I was a full-time academic, actually, up to about five years ago when I went and ran Open Knowledge. And I've just, in fact, kind of stepped down from being executive with the CEO at Open Knowledge. We now have a wonderful new CEO called Pavel Richter. And so kind of I'm, I'm, I'm available. <laughs> so I want to talk about what I'm going to really kind of the summary of this, of this talk. Um, and the first point I just want to make, and I'm going to really take, go through this just to say what I'm going to say, and I'm going to tell you in more detail. One is we're entering information age. I'm going to talk more about that. But all around us, the things that we use, uh, the things that we produce, the things that we trade, will increasingly be information goods. Just as we moved from the era of agriculture to the, area of, to the era of industry, we're now moving to the era of information. Second, this age can and should be open. I'm going to define exactly what I mean by that in a moment, but this age should be an open information age. I want to tell you about how this will actually work, concretely. It's all very good, you know, am I what they sometimes refer to as a free tart? Hey, man, everything should just be free and open, and wouldn't it be amazing? Um, I'm not. I'm just going to tell you that in advance. And the need for action. Like, the reason, you know, it's wonderful to be up here speaking to all of you, but the reason I come, no, I mean, both to talk to Martin, also Christopher, but to talk to you is because it won't happen on its own. It is not inevitable that we will get an open information age. It's far from inevitable, and it will take concerted action by us, by people working together to have that happen. And that means that we need to build a movement. And, one of, and that means people need to be inspired, and they need to realize the need for action, and then they need to go and take action. So I'm going to start with my, the vision. What is my vision, and what is, I hope, a general vision that might be shared? It's not mine. It didn't, wasn't one I invented. It's one I, like most things, borrowed, came from other people, and was inspired by others. But this is a vision. And the vision is of an open world. And that's a world, and I just want to say this to you because it's I hope it's a little bit radical. It's a world where all public information is open, free for everyone to use, build on, and share. And when I say all public information, I'm going to say that in a moment, but I don't mean government information. I just mean all information that isn't private or personal is open. 
and, that, and it's freely available and where creators and innovators are recognized and supported. And I add that because sometimes the first thing you think is, wow, well then how does anyone ever get paid to do so? So both of those things, that's what happens in an open world. Just to say public means non-private, it's kind of published. So I mean any information that you could give or sell to anyone else that was allowed to do that if it was information you were legitimately allowed to do that. So for example, I cannot legitimately give or sell the text messages between you and your partner to anybody else in the world normally unless you've said it's okay, right? That would not be allowed. That's, that's not something anyone in fact is you know, allowed to normally do um, without your permission, for example. Um, but for example, all software or all movies that you go to the cinema to see, you know, anyone can go to the movie and see that, could go and see that, you know, that movie if they pay money, right? It is legally and legitimately made available to everyone else. And so everything that we currently do, of, which is information, which is turned into digital bits, from the recipes for new drugs, to books, to music, to movies, to software, to research, I'm claiming that all of that can and should be open, free for anyone to access, to build on, or share. That is the world I would like us to create. And I just said, I'm not, people can read the story, I'm not going to go into it. And I want this world because I think it is fairer, it is freer, and is more creative and innovative. That's why I want it. And I wanted to say, say something just at this moment before we come to the end of it, which is, I also said something at the beginning about information age, and I'll come back to it, which is, this might have always been true, the things that I'm saying. It might have been true in 8th century or 7th century Ireland, when St. Columba had an argument about copyright, proto-copyright in the Bible. <laughs> it's been true, some of the things I'm going to say, for a long time. But we haven't lived in an information age for a long time. You know, information has already we've been there. We spoke to people. We told them things. There's a tasty antelope over there. There's a big tiger coming. But it wasn't the majority of what we were going to maybe produce or trade or use. And that is the world we're entering. So the way we run that world is a really big deal. And so this is a, you know, this is not just making the information part of our world fairer and freer and more creative. It's making what's going to be the large amount of our at least economic and social activity fairer, freer, and more creative. So there's a but. And all good talks, I hope, should have some kind of mystery that you should be wondering about, right? And the but is this, which is normally, how do we pay for it? Like, it's great. I could sit here and go, man, everything should be free. Like, I want like a house that's like as big as Glasgow University. Some people have houses that big. You know, I don't know. Speak for myself. So, I mean, some people I said, you know, you know, but, okay. but you know, you wouldn't, but I'm just saying it's like, or I might say, you know, I want 10 cars or like pe people can say what they want about it. Like I just want everything man to be open free. Normally like that, that's, you know, it's like, yeah, whatever. Like who's gonna pay for it? Like money doesn't grow on trees. And often, the, I think sometimes maybe they willfully misunderstand, but people think that, that those of us who go around talking about openness, that's what we imagine, like money kind of grows on trees and it will just kind of like, it's all going to be great. And so how do we pay for it? How is this system going to work if I'm saying everything, all this information is open? It's expensive to make movies. It's expensive to create new drugs. It's expensive to do all the research that goes on in this university. Well, much of which is open, by the way, and we'll come to that. So how do, we get, and how do we get there? How do we pay for it? How do we get them from where we are today? Because for those of you, maybe you haven't noticed, the world today isn't like this yet. The world today is not yet open like this. In fact, it is increasingly closed in many ways, you might say. Some parts of it, you might say, are getting more open, but a lot of it is getting more closed. There are our monopoly rights, like patents and copyright, et cetera, et cetera. So, and we also need to understand really what's wrong with the current system. I mean, I said this world is fairer and freer and more creative, but I'm just saying that, right? So, 
I want to start with the story, but that's the mystery. That's the thing that should have you on the edge of your seats with excitement. Like, how is he, how is he going to do this? <laughs> so, I want to tell a story, and I want to start with one uh, thing here, something very concrete. And many of you may already be interested in this area. That's why you've turned up. But I also talk to quite a lot of people who aren't so interested uh, in digital technology. I, like, I talk to my mother, who's a farmer. My mother is, you know, has very limited interest in, in digital technology or information. In fact, I would say she has an active antipathy towards the area. <laughs> and one of the things that's important is that we need to engage people with this. So I constantly am trying to understand how we can relate these matters, which I think are of really profound importance to everyone, even the poorest people on this planet, as well as the richest, how we could do it in a way that is really relevant and really understandable. And obviously one of those, is, is one area is just everyone probably in their life has, will get sick at some point. I mean, at some point many of us will get sick and die. One point long in the distant future, I hope. Um, but most of us know, either have been sick in our own lives or know people who are sick. And in my case, I have a very close relative who's very ill. They have an illness that might well kill them, actually, is they're very sick. And one of the things, obviously, that, that, you know, is that they are, they're, they're, their sickness is to do with their lungs and to do with the kind of degeneration of their lungs. And one of the big things, obviously, is medicine, you know, can, can you know, even, if, you know, what can be done? What can the doctors do? And, you know, in this area, it's kind of amazing. There is a new, there's a new drug, and it may, it may not save them, but it might, you know, bring a few precious more years of their life. Uh, and it's, you know, but there's a thing about this drug. First of all, I know it's maybe, but just to reflect for a moment, that medicines aren't, they're not just a pill. Like when, when, that, that, when my relative, you know, uh, Mary, when she takes those pills, you know, that they're, they're a physical thing. You know, they come out of a, a, you know, metal plastic thing. But actually inside a medicine is information, that, in a way, right? Inside, I mean, strictly inside the medicine is chemicals. But the recipe that makes those chemicals is information. And there's so medicines are made of information. They're made, the science behind the discovery, there's the tests in the clinical trials that show that the drug actually was good for you and didn't kill you. And there's, of course, the recipe for the drug itself, the formula. So my relative doesn't actually really get this. They just get that they need a medicine. They don't really actually, you know. But this is true, that actually really related to any time you get ill and you take a drug, you're basically eating information. That's what you're doing, in a way. You're eating information. You're eating human knowledge. And medicines can be very expensive. The, and this is correct. The drug that my relative Mary takes costs over $40,000 a year. It costs over 100 pounds each day, that drug. It's incredibly expensive. But that's, I mean, that's more money than many people earn in a year. And the only reason that Mary can actually, it's very, I mean, what's funny is like Mary initially couldn't take the drug. It was so expensive that she couldn't really, was going to be able to take it. Um, but, you know, when she, one of the other ironies, I mean, you know, the NHS, fortunately in the UK we have the NHS, which is kind of taxpayer funded and will pay, it's kind of for those drugs. But in fact, in this case, the drug was so expensive that they wouldn't pay until she got ill enough. You know, she, she had to get ill enough that then it was worth giving her the drug because the impact, the impact was high enough at that point, you know? So she couldn't take the drug for a whole bunch of time and got iller. And, will there, and you know, will die or, may, or either may, may, may not survive. So medicines can be very expensive. And why are they so expensive? Because you might think it's like the chemicals, like in those drugs, you know, it's like, it's like, plutonium or something. I don't know. You know, it's really hard to make those drugs. But that actually isn't the case. If you go and look, the actual cost of making the drug, and I hope I'm not, most of you may probably already know this, but if you actually look at the manufacturing cost of drugs, it probably depends. Maybe they're like 5% of the price. Maybe they're even less. In some cases, they're 1%. Sometimes they're a little bit more. So what is the 90... Why are medicines so expensive? Why is 95% of the cost of a drug? What is it in that pill, right? And the answer is that this is the drug recipe information charge, right? It's 
paying for the information. It's not paying for the chemicals. It's not paying for manufacturing it in that like plant somewhere and then shipping it to your pharmacy. It's paying for the drug information. And like, why is that so expensive? You know, because just for a moment, right? I mean, that drug, has anyone ever seen a drug formula written out? Like it's, it's not like, it doesn't require like server farms to store. Right? It's not hugely expensive to store chemical recipes. Right? You, you could send it in an email. And even having someone smart enough to turn a recipe into manufacturing process is not very expensive. Right? It, it's, so the information can be sent by the click of a button in an email. It's costless almost to copy that information. And it's certainly very cheap to copy that information to new drugs. Like, you know, it just prints out new drugs, that, that manufacturing plant, you know, there's a huge vat of chemicals, they make the drug, you know, it, it, and, you know, lots and lots of drugs come off, it's not like each time there's any expense. Now, many people here are lawyers, so they'll know, and the reason it's so expensive is this thing called a patent monopoly. Our governments created monopolies, special, like, rather than allowing anyone to use the drug recipe and manufacture drugs, there's a monopoly. Like, someone has the right to prevent anyone else using that recipe without them being paid. Okay? And it's called a patent, in, in traditionally. Mainly because originally it was called letters patent, and that was because the king, or the queen, had a special stamp, and they could grant these monopolies. And by the way, at that point, they granted these monopolies for lots of things. It was a way of basically taxing people and giving favors to people in, who you liked. You might give someone a letters patent on... I don't know, manufacturing silk thread or gold thread. In fact, they did do that. You might give someone a letters patent on salt, kind of, or whatever. But you also gave people letters patents on inventions. They were monopolies. And that's continued. And, you know, that's, that's why it's so expensive, is this a patent monopoly, which means I'm in charge. I can decide the price because I'm the only person who allows to make the drug or allow other people to make the drug. So I can set a nice high price and charge lots of money. And, that, in some sense, by the way, makes some sense, right? I mean, why is there a monopoly? Well, because the costs of making that pill, which are on the left, well, there's making it in the, man, in, the, in, the man, in, the, in the plant, but there's also all these costs of creating the drug in the first place, right? We get this. It costs lots of time, scientists, theory researched, and there's some profits. There was, you know, the return on capital that's important. We're here, Adam Smith. Uh, you know, there needs to be some return of capital. So the revenue is this patent monopoly is there so that we cover these costs of making the creating and information in the first place, right? This is really noddy stuff, I hope, for many people here that they get, right? So what's the problem with this? Like, why? This sounds pretty good, right? I mean, you know, the drug gets made, this seems reasonable. <coughs> well, monopolies are bad for you. Monopolies are not very good for you. Um, they're not, and I, maybe I need to explain, for example, when there's a monopoly and the price goes up, as I described, my relative Mary couldn't take the drug until the NHS were okay to pay for it. And by the way, the NHS is just all of us. You know, when the NHS pays for that $40,000 a year, that's our money. And it's money that doesn't get spent on schools, or it doesn't get spent on other treatment in hospital, or it doesn't get spent on some other activity like roads or whatever it is that the government could spend money on. And, but fundamentally, people denied access to medicine. And I asked this before, but I'm interested in this room. Who here has seen the TV series Breaking Bad? I've seen it. Some people here. OK, so it's real like homework is to go and watch some Breaking Bad. Um, but in that TV series, a middle class American school teacher gets cancer, and he's not able to pay for the cancer treatment that he needs, the really effective one. You know, the doctor says, this is the treatment you really need, but it's not covered by your health plan. And this is a middle class guy, and he is going to, he may well die as a result. And he's in the US, one of the richest countries in the world. And as the story goes, obviously he has to turn to methamphetamine dealing. It's not the usual solution. But, um, but you know, okay, so some people, and when you joke, okay, there's a great study, 2005, in the American Comic Review, Goldberg and Gia, uh, Penelope Goldberg and Gia, looking at India and looking what would happen when new patents were going to come in. India did not have patents on pharmaceutical drugs until TRIPS came along. They only had process patents. They didn't have patents for products. And they estimated this huge impact as patents came in of people being denied access to kind of 
basic essential you know, drugs that, that would be really important. So this isn't just about school teachers in the US, it's also about people in the poorest countries as well as the richest. And so some people can't afford them, and when those people can't afford them, obviously they miss out on using the drug. They, they, they stay ill for longer, maybe they die. So in the economists, there's this great term for this stuff, it's called the dead weight loss of a monopoly. And in this case, it literally is dead weight. Like people die, maybe, right? So the other aspect is lost innovation. Not only do people who, not only is that you don't get access to the drug to consume it, but the way that science works is that we build on the past. We build on the previous research. Newton said, I, because I've only seen father because I stood on the shoulders of giants. And when you have these patents, patents don't only prevent access to use the thing to manufacture the drug, it also can prevent using that to build on for research in certain cases. It can make it more difficult to do research. It can make it more difficult to innovate and create new software when there's patents on existing software. And for example, there's another great paper from a few years ago that looks on patents on the human genome. The human genome was very interesting because there was a private consortium that was kind of proprietary and for profit and there was the public genome project that was going to open all of its data. And some parts of the genome therefore got patented and some parts didn't. And the researchers were able to look and they showed that there was 30% lost innovation, for example, which, you know, in this area when the, the, the genome areas were patented. And this means fewer new drugs. It actually means that while we pay for the drug today, we'll make it more expensive to develop the drugs for the future, or maybe impossible. And the other thing is just looking at medicine. There are the major inefficiencies of the patent system when you look at it. For example, people keep clinical trial data hidden. Patents aren't just about the formula for the drug. Also, people don't release openly information about how safe the drug is. Like half of all clinical start, trial studies may not get adequately published. There are major incentives because of the patent system to suppress information for your blockbuster drugs. There's also incentives to create Me Too drugs, drugs that basically are no different or very close to existing drugs, but get you a new patent, and where you can then take over that. And you spend a lot of money on marketing. So one of the interesting things about the pharmaceutical industry is they spend somewhere between 50% to 100% more on marketing than they spend on research to create new drugs. Right? They actually spend 30% or more of their revenues on marketing versus 17% on actually finding new drugs in the United States, for example. So it's not working very well, right? So on the right, you have what consumers actually pay. There's the dead weight loss, the, 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 the people who would have got to take drugs, who would have got healthy but didn't. You have the patent monopoly cost, and then on the left, you have this actual R&D creating information. This is the only reason we have the patents, right? Is to fund R&D and maybe a little bit of profits. We need the capitalists to get re return on capital, otherwise they wouldn't give it to us, maybe. But that's, that's why we have it. We have it for this red area up the front. But we're paying this and we're paying this for it. It's really inefficient. And that dead weight loss, again, is not just people who don't get the medicine, it's the new drugs that don't get created. So. In an open system, just and this is a taste I'm going to talk a bit more in a moment, but in an open system, it's really simple. You make drugs open. Anyone can manufacture a drug. We already know what this is like, by the way, because for those of you who don't know it, by the way, patents come to an end. These monopolies the government grant, because they're so bad, they only last for a limited time. They go away after a period of time. And after that, anyone can manufacture the drug. <coughs> for example, if you ever go and take ibuprofen, or paracetamol, they are drugs that no longer are in patent, that anybody can manufacture. And in that case, when you buy the pill, all you're paying for is the manufacturing cost. That's why ibuprofen is incredibly cheap. You can buy whole packets of ibuprofen for like a pound, right? It's very cheap. So when you buy a pill, you just buy for the pay for the manufacturing cost. And in your taxes, or some other mechanism, we pay for the research and development and maybe a little bit of profits for the people funding research and development, right? We, we like market-based capitalism quite a lot. So, you know, that's if, you know, so that's what happens. Consumers only pay that. And this is a way, way better model. That's, that's the rough suggestion. And just to note something, if you think I'm a crazy radical person, is that we already do this in that socialistic, 
country known as the United States of America, the government already funds half of all healthcare R&D just about, or close to half. Maybe people debate it, maybe it's 40% or something like that. The government already pays for half of research and development. The rest of it is incredibly inefficiently provided by industry, mainly never doing the basic R&D that actually leads to new breakthroughs, but mainly the final R&D and testing. And then they, they even mess up clinical testing often. Now I want to emphasize something. This is a story about medicines that I hope even, like, like I'm, not, I'm not saying I even hope, I've tried this out with my mother and she gets it, right? My mother, my mother really understands this. And, and, and she's a very smart lady, by the way. It's just that like, she really gets why this might be relevant to her rather than all that stuff I do on the internet all the time, right? So it's, and it's not just about medicines, right? Information is everywhere, right? It, in, it, it powers, you know, software runs huge amounts of our infrastructure from, it, it helps run at least and organize our energy systems, our transport, um, the movies and music, the things we do in our free time nowadays, at least in countries like this, we watch films, we stream music, we read books, we message people on social networks. Information is everywhere. We are entering information age. Really, where the majority of what we produce, as I said, what we consume, what we trade is information, whether it's software, whether it's databases. We're not there yet. But just imagine, imagine I sat there in 1800 and said, agriculture is not going to be the thing of the future. People would have laughed at me, like 90% of the coal population worked in agriculture. Today, less than 1% of the UK's population works in agriculture. I mean, my mother does, my mother's a farmer, but very few of us now work in agriculture. It's still very important, by the way, we need to eat. It's very important. And similarly, you know, it's like industrial stuff. This is the future. And it's everywhere and it can be open. So I want to explain a little bit about this open world. Let me just keep an eye on my time. So I want to start with something really, really important. And it leads back to that thing of me explaining before, like the kind of money growing on trees. And if I went out and said, guys, wouldn't it be beautiful if everyone who wanted a Ferrari, had a Ferrari. You'd say, yeah, Rufus, that's beautiful. It's not gonna happen, right? It's not possible, probably. I mean, I don't know, we probably do have enough metal on the planet, but it would be difficult, you know, for everyone to have a Ferrari. Um, you know, and, and just even to go back just a few, a few centuries, you know, if I said, hey, one day everyone will just have enough to eat. I know we're getting, maybe, but some places in the world, we're getting to that place. But it wasn't like I could just say magically, like it was fairy stories. In fairy stories, food magically reproduces. Like, I don't know, is it Hansel and Gretel? I can't remember which fairy story, but you know, there's just more, there's just unlimited amounts of food. And like for medieval peasants, this was just like magic, that thought that that would happen. And so this is physical, fundamental physical fact that it, things don't just like reproduce, right? I don't just don't get more tables because I want them, or more laptops, or more cars. Right? Physical goods don't magically reproduce. <coughs> but information does. Like, right now, I'm telling you things. You may, if I am lucky, learn something from me. I, if, I've done a, you know, if I'm doing an okay job, right? You, you'll go away from this lecture knowing something more than when you came. Information will have stored itself in your brain. Right? And it happened magically. Almost. I mean, yes, you have to expend some energy on your neurons and so on. You have to eat, otherwise your brain will die. But in general, the cost of it was almost nothing. Information reproduces. For example, if you go home tonight and you watch Breaking Bad or you read William Shakespeare, it will still be there tomorrow. It will not have been used up. We won't be, oh my God, you watched the last copy of Breaking Bad? Like, we've all had that experience, right, when someone ate the last piece of cake. You ate the last piece of cake? I was saving it. It was mine. Has anyone had that experience? <laughs> right, 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 okay? But that doesn't happen with, like, my God, you watch Breaking Bad and it's not left for me, it's gone, it's been used up. Like, it just doesn't happen, right? No, I mean, no. 
It, it doesn't happen. And it, now, I know this is so obvious to you, and I'm kind of making, but it is very profound. Particularly because we're moving into a world built around information. It means the fundamental good that our society will manufacture, if you like, and transmit around and deal with has this completely different property. It's called, in economics terminology, it's called non-rival. A cake is rivalrous. Either you eat the slice or I eat the slice, right? Land is rivalrous. It's my piece of land or it's your piece of land, right? It's my house or it's your house. We might sh decide to share the house. We might even decide to share a bed, but it can get kind of uncomfortable at certain points, right? You know, like the sharing, there, it is ultimately rivalrous. Don't get confused that we share some things. It, there is actually rivalry there. But information is non-rival. You can read William Shakespeare as much as you want, and sh William Shakespeare's texts will still be there. We are not used to this world. And this is, this is very important because, in general, I would argue one of the biggest problems we have in talking and having policy around this area is that people use the model of the old world. Because we have spent so long as human beings, because we have spent thousands of years in that world of like cake and bread and cars and shoes, we're not used to this world of information. And we often try and take the rules that we created for the old world and apply them to the new world, right? For example, just to make one very concrete one, humans have invented a system of what is called property rights. And they've developed for thousands of years as far as we can tell. They're often the most sophisticated areas of law where we look at the way that real property like land how it could be controlled. And what we did, in a way, was we created social rules, laws, that aligned up with the physical fact of exclusivity, of rivalry. Only one person can use this piece of land to build a house. So often, what property rights do is say, OK, someone exclusively has control of that piece of land in the law. We create these social rules that align with this physical fact. And what we often try to do is do the same thing with information. I mean, you notice it. People talk about intellectual property rights. I mean, it just, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's a complete mistake, but they do it, right? Because they try, they take this concept that has thousands of years of practice and behavior and development behind it that applied to real property and try and apply it to information, if you, I shouldn't say real, so to real physical goods. The thousands of years of dealing with real physical goods and apply it to information. And the thing is, people, even the most zealous believers in the property rights of information, right, kind of must somehow, deep down, they kind of know it's not true, right? I mean, just as one example of this, that it's can't just, it just isn't like normal, like physical stuff, and that therefore property rights don't make immediate sense in the same way, is it kind of expires. I mean, this doesn't happen with traditional property rights. Like, if you own your house, it doesn't suddenly stop being your house in, like, 10 years' time. You can lease a house, but, by the way, leasing or renting a house is not owning it. Right? It doesn't suddenly just evaporate. You don't suddenly go, oh, I don't own my house anymore. And the other example is often people who went around just taking other people's property, their land, were treated quite toughly in the past. Like, they were executed in unpleasant ways. In particular, there were groups called pirates who went around, often on the high seas, taking what was not theirs and ending up in Disney movies. OK? And pirates, what happened to pirates traditionally? Bad things. I mean, for example, if you know the story about Caesar, Caesar got captured by some pirates eventually got released, went back and got the pirates and crucified all of them. Pirates were not treated very nicely. They were undermining one of the fundamental social rules of, of, a, of a civilized society, which was property rights for real, prop for real goods, for real physical things. Do you know what happens to kind of pirates in the area of intellectual property, like in the 18th century? Like, they did not get executed when they were caught. 
Like, often at most they were fined a bit. Occasionally they might go to jail. I mean, even today, in the most extreme fantasies of IP rights maximists, of the Business Software Alliance, in their reports on IP piracy last year, they do not call for execution. They do not even normally call for long-term imprisonment. People realize that these are not the same thing, deep down. They are fundamentally different. But it is crucial because bad mental models, mistaken logic, is very powerful. It determines how people think about things and their default way of thinking about things. So that's why I've gone on at such length. And that is a crucial point because information being different makes openness feasible. If I just went around saying, hey man, let's just share it all with like land, it doesn't make any sense. There isn't more land to go around. Whereas I can go around and say, let's just share William Shakespeare, man. Let's have him be open and free. And in fact, everyone agrees William Shakespeare is in the public domain. Anyone can access William Shakespeare's works. So it, it happens in this area. And it therefore is one fundamental point that openness is even possible because once a work exists, we can just share it to lots and lots of people. That's possible, right? The magic can happen. Um, but, and I do emphasize this, of course, people say, well, great, once you've got William Shakespeare's works, but how do you create them in the first place? Going back to the drug example, my relative's Mary's drug, you know, it isn't, they aren't just evil people who are charging $40,000 a year or something or just out for profit. They spent probably a lot of money. And the drug is quite expensive because not many people get the disease that Mary gets. So we do have to think about how we pay to create new drugs or new movies in the first place. So I want to explain that I'm not some crazy kind of guy just saying everyone can just produce drug research in their spare time. You know, or we will write the future operating systems of the world just through people voluntarily doing it in their couple of hours before bedtime. That is not what I am suggesting. So the basic pool, going back to that model, is there's a different way we can pay creators. Like the traditional model, if you like, with monopoly rights, is they get these monopolies and they get to charge you. I'm suggesting a different model, which is that we pay money into a funding pool. This is the basic model. We, as citizens or consumers, pay into some funding pool. I'll talk about how we do that in a moment. That money gets to kind of allocated to creators in several different interesting ways. I'm going to go on about this in a moment, just because people you know, might be saying also stuff like, Rufus, you're suggesting that we kind of raise all this money and like the obvious people, for example, to run the funding pool is the state. This is, we raise this money through taxation. And they might be saying stuff like, are you suggesting that the government should decide what pop music gets created? Are you crazy? I don't want to listen to hits from the 50s again and again or whatever it is that the bureaucrats would decide on. So. This is the basic open model. Money goes here, goes into the funding pool, gets allocated to innovators and creators, and we get new information. And we've been doing this for a long time. Right now, for the audience out there when they get to ever watch this, I'm at Glasgow University. Glasgow University is largely funded by citizens and consumers through their taxes. They then get given to professors and other people to do research. That's what we already do. So this is the open model. So I have a real model and it can work. And I'm about just to give you some detail though. So for example, let's look at pharmaceuticals. And I just want to walk through this in a little detail so you really understand what I'm suggesting. First of all, you might how you've got this funding pool, you might set half of GDP, half a percent of GDP right now. So just to take the United States as America, I hope I'm getting my numbers right. The United States has about five trillion, I think, in GDP, something like that. I hope I'm getting my numbers right. So 0.5% of GDP, I'm getting my numbers, is around 250 billion. No, am I getting, am I getting my, uh, no, is that correct? No, I should be saying 1% of GDP. So it would be 50, that would be 50 billion. So I wouldn't actually want 1% of GDP, I want about 100 billion. So right now, the United States does spend around 100 billion a year on pharmaceutical R&D, on developing new drugs. And so you'd put about 1% of GDP, if I'm getting my numbers correct, uh, in there, um, into, this, into this funding pool. 
Now, I want to explain these two things. So there's two ways. This, this, how we raise this money is relatively straightforward, right? We already do it quite effectively. We could think of somewhat other innovative ways of doing it, but the basic model is you'd pay for it in your taxes, as you already do pay for the NHS here and other things, and the NHS buys drugs, right? Um, so one of the things I just want to talk about is the remuneration rights and upfront. So by upfront funding, I mean what we already do when we pay for research and academics. We take money and we say, here, researcher, you're doing great work on, like, I don't know, gene therapies. Please go and do more work on gene therapies, and that's, that's, that's what we're going to pay you to do. And essentially, it's expert selection. We put money in a pool for the research councils or the N National Institute for Health in the United States, and the money goes, and experts decide who gets money, and so on. The thing I want to emphasize is because people would say, hey, I don't know, and I just want to say this for the people who might get up on arms about, like, socialistic medicine or something, I don't know, is there is a real option where we retain a lot of the market aspects of the current system, like people destroyed what drugs they might want to take or whatever. And that's we could put money into what I pool, which is called remuneration rights. And remuneration rights would work like this. The money would go in the pool, and then eat, and there would be like, I don't know, $50 billion in the pool. And then at the end of the year, you'd work out what drugs people had taken that year. And you can do that quite easily. And you, might, you wouldn't have to go and look what everyone had done. You'd have a statistical sample. You might sample. You'd ask 10,000 people to participate, and you'd look at what drugs they'd taken, and you'd look at the health impact that it had, by the way, which we already do as well already because we like to know what we should spend money on. Like the NHS worries about like, what drugs should it fund or not fund, like with my relative Mary. Like, should she get the drug or should she not get the drug? Is it value for money or not? So you'd, you'd do this, and you'd assess what drugs had, had what impact on healthcare that year. And you'd use something actually called qualies, quality adjusted life years, roughly. Someone, when I talked about this the other day, said, well, what about Viagra? I mean, it doesn't save anyone's life, but you know, maybe it improves people's lives. That would be included too, right? You would be able to decide, you'd estimate, you know, maybe Viagra isn't as important as a drug that stops you getting paralyzed. <laughs> maybe. I mean, by the way, in terms of actual spending on drugs, that isn't the incentives that pharmaceutical companies face. They will actually spend maybe more money researching Viagra than drugs that will save you getting paralyzed, but because of the incentives of the market system currently. But the remunerations rights allow that demand-based stuff to happen. It allows people would apply for a remuneration right, a bit like they apply for a patent. They'd say, we invented this drug. We, therefore, are entitled to get paid out of this remuneration rights pool for our drug's usage. And you'd pay them in proportion to the amount of health that they'd kind of saved, like the amount of lives they'd saved, the amount of you know, improvement in people's lives. So you might say, 10,000 people last year didn't die because they took your drug, and you'd add this up relative to the other things, and you'd divide up the money proportionally, roughly. Right? And the beauty of this, the beauty of this is it doesn't involve the government in deciding what should be created or not created. Right? There are downsides to it, but the real beauty of it is it allows, for example, venture capitalists. Venture capitalists can come along and say, You've got a great idea for a new drug. Maybe the government, you know, it doesn't matter what the government thinks, we'll back you to develop it. If it's a hit, you'll get a remuneration right, and you'll get paid out of this fund. And out of that fund, we'll, make, we'll maybe be very, we'll become wealthy people or not. So it allows you to tap in to traditional capitalism, to all of the funding backing that you'd normally have. And it also allows you to have demand-based signaling. Like one of the great things about markets is we don't have to depend on the government to decide what we should manufacture. You know, there's, <laughs> that model hasn't always been that successful, right? So it allows, it allows demand, i.e. what consumers actually decide to take and what actually happens to them to inform stuff. So that's what you can do. And you could vary this. And I've also put down here, for example, a prize pool. You could also, the other way of funding innovation is to say, we're going to pay for, we need a new cancer drug that deals with this particular issue. We don't know the way that we should go and do research, but we'll give $50 million to whoever comes up with, the, with, a, with a drug that solves that problem. And again, this is pretty old and it's been used, this approach has been used a lot and it's quite successful. Okay, I'm just gonna talk about one other area to tell you that I'm not just talking about medicines. I'm also talking about a completely different area of information, which is music. So music, by the way, is again information. It's digital bits, that's digital bits that stream down to your music player, it is information. And I do want to distinguish here, I don't mean music as performance. Obviously, the area of, of music as an industry incorporates a lot more than just recording tracks. Here, I'm focusing on the recording and the informational part, not the live performance part. 
which I could have maybe, I could have drawn on here is another, artists get revenue from other areas in the music industry than just getting paid to create new music or works or perform new recordings. And I've admitted that. In fact, in fact, in the music industry, that area may be more lucrative and generate more money for artists and creators by quite a way than is generated from actually selling musical information to people. But just taking these on here, these again, real, real, I'm trying to do real numbers. Um, um, I hope I'm getting my, my numbers. I'm not quite getting my numbers right here. But this is the funding pool. At the moment, you might argue it's around 600 million pounds a year. That's not total revenues to the music industry, but if you work out how much goes to artists, it's kind of difficult to actually work out how much goes to artists and creators, but you could make a stab at it. And you might say that somewhere around 50p to a pound a month, if we all paid 50 pence, somewhere between 50 pence and a pound a month, maybe less, maybe more, depending on how we did it, on, for example, your data service. When you buy a mobile phone and you pay your money, on your data plan, you'd have an extra 50p, or you pay 50p on your internet connection a month. And that would then, that between 50p and a pound, would pay for all current money going to artists and creators in the UK. Right? And then some. And again, you could divide it up. And just here as an example, I tried to do the things in size. Here, you probably wouldn't do so much up, uh, upfront funding. In, in the area of music, people kind of feel that it's more up to consumer taste. It's not up to, you know, whereas in, in healthcare, we kind of get the experts deciding what we do research on. It's better than me going, yeah, I really think that like, um, gene therapy is way better than like, the molecular biology route. Like, you know, it's not really up to me to decide what gets funded in that way, or even decide what drugs are really going to work for me. I don't, I don't really know. I have to rely on my doctor. But in this area, we kind of, in music, we generally think that it's not up to experts to decide what music gets produced. So the majority of money would go to remuneration rights, which are completely demand-based. Artists would get paid in proportion to their music got played last year. You might, and I emphasize this, you might be progressive. You might decide that the music industry is a bit unfair and there are a few massive stars and most people don't get very much money. So you might make remuneration rights. You might divide up the money, not quite in proportion to usage. You might give a bit more money to the less well-off artists and a bit less, sorry, a bit more to the less well-off less well artists and a bit less money to the very rich artists. But in general, this would be based on remuneration rights money. This would be a big pot, maybe 500 million pounds. It would be divided up in proportion to the amount of music that got played. Then I've got, just for fun, I talked about X Factor. You might also have a model, and I think this is kind of fun, where you might say, hey, everyone gets like a hundred, I don't know, three pounds, or I don't really need to make the money up, but let's say one or two pounds, and you get to vote it. So artists can come along at the year, they could propose projects, you know, new operas they're going to produce, new albums they're going to write, and you get to vote. You get to say, yes, it's like Kickstarter or X Factor. You could say, yes, I want to give my money to this artist. And if they get enough money, they can go and produce their works. So you could also have interesting models like that, the kind of X Factor or Kickstarter model in this fund. And again, let me emphasize, government's role here is in helping raise the money. Government has very little role in deciding how it's distributed. You can really separate collection from allocation. And that's important because you don't, government traditionally hasn't always proved fantastic at making complex allocation decisions. Using market-based demand is often a good idea. Okay, I keep an eye on time. I'm nearly there. So, why is it better? I've explained how it would work. So first of all, just open means access for all. It's just really obvious. In this model, we still pay for the information to be created. Musicians still get to make albums. They get paid well. Maybe there's some even superstars who get, you know, get to live wild lives and be read about in the tabloids, right? And drugs still get produced. Drugs are expensive to make, but they still get produced. But everyone now has access, or everyone, at least the cost of money, there's still a cost of manufacturing on things, but certainly for music, the cost of access is basically zero. It's the cost of an internet connection, right? And it means access for all. So that's, and that's a huge deal. In a world which is going to be built around information, that is going to be massive. I don't, you know, I don't know if people are aware at the moment, but often you know, it does happen. Like You can't perform Beckett without permission of the Beckett estate. You have to go and get permission from Thomas, you know, his estate. Not him, his estate, because he's dead, saying, can I perform Waiting for Godot in a certain way? Um, 
You look at the software industry right now, there's all kinds of examples of things that don't, that don't get created or where there are issues because of sometimes litigation. And, 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 it, and, and the thing I want to emphasize at the moment is it's hard to measure that because we don't see what doesn't happen today. And I give them an example. I don't know. It would be very impressive if people know who this is a picture of. But this is a picture of Einstein as a baby. The point about babies is you don't know what they grow up into. Some babies grow up into being Einstein. Some don't. And that's the point about innovation and creativity. And right now, we often, if you like, and I put it a bit recently, we kind of kill off Einsteins, some of them. We, by, 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 by having monopoly rights and allowing people to decide, it's like someone deciding, oh, Einstein, we're going to allow this baby to grow up, but not this baby. But in this future, anyone will be able to build on the work that already exists. And it will therefore be a world in which creativity and innovation will be much greater. And the one example I think we have today is the internet. The internet was a place where anyone could connect, anyone could innovate in its early stages. And as a result, it was one of the most dynamic, creative, innovative things we've ever seen. And people don't realize it. Most other things are not like that. They're not as innovative. And that's because actually they're normally closed. Someone's in charge. OK, and finally, I want to say open is freedom. And I really mean this profoundly in a certain sense. If we're going to have an age which is built around information, in a closed world, people get to decide. They get to decide whether you get to use something or read something or access something. And even though I mean it in a quite extreme sense, like looking at the infrastructures, information infrastructure we have today, like Google or Facebook, they decide ultimately with their algorithms what you discover and what you don't. And it's not transparent. And you don't get to change it or tweak it. Imagine I wanted to have a different search algorithm on Google. I mean, maybe it's like whenever I search for artists, women artists were at the top of the list. I mean, I, you know, I could make up all kinds of examples. But there are all kinds of ways that I might want to change the filter of those systems. And I don't get to. And so in a very profound way, closed systems limit our freedom. And they limit our freedom as human beings to understand, and to hold to power to account, to learn. If knowledge is power, openness is empowerment. And I want to add to that also one last point, which is we get to collaborate and build community in an online world in a really different way if we embrace openness. Maybe it's something we're fortunate enough in some parts of the world like this one where just having our daily bread is no longer so much of our concern. We know that we'll probably get to eat tonight. As that happens, as we get to enter a world of abundance, other things maybe matter more. Friendship, community, collaboration, creativity. An open world is one in which those things flourish, where you do not need to seek permission and where you get to collaborate freely and rapidly with others. And finally, because we talk a lot about income inequality, I want to emphasize something about open being fairer. Generally, closed means concentrated power and wealth. I don't know if you've noticed, but this information age spawns a lot of very concentrated wealth. Like the most, the, many of the richest people in the world, like extraordinarily rich people, are people who had information monopolies of one kind or other. Microsoft is an information monopoly in software. Facebook is an information monopoly of a kind. And what I wanted to show this diagram is this is the same amount of wealth here as on the left, but it's just broken up into some much smaller parts. An open world is a much fairer world. It's a world on the right rather than the world on the left. In fact, I haven't even been fair. There's more wealth in the open world, but it's divided up amongst more people. The analogy I like to offer to you is the difference often between de doctors, engineers, and lawyers, and Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. Lawyers make a good living. As doctors and engineers make a good living, they are professionals who work actually in, in the information industry. Lawyers work with open information, the law. <laughs> Most of the time, it's open. Doctors work with open information. They make a reasonably and good living, as do engineers. But they do not normally become unimaginably wealthy. That is the world we want, is of doctors, lawyers, and engineers. It is a fair and unequal. And if you think that inequality is an issue, wait till you've seen an information age which is built around closed and proprietary. It will be massively concentrated wealth and power of a kind we haven't even yet seen. So, I just need to, what's in the way? So this is the point, if it's so great, why aren't we doing it already? Like if you're so smart, why aren't you so rich, right? 
So two things I want to come back to, and I've said most of it already. One is mistaken mental models. Why have we got an issue with this? People are applying the old model of real physical goods to the world of information. They think it's like we need property rights. We had property rights in the old world, and they were a really good thing, and people who were against property rights were crazy communists who led to very bad outcomes, at least in some countries in the world. Are you a communist? No, I'm not a communist, right? But they have this mental model where they associate openness or these kind of ideas with anarchism and radicalism. No, it's not the case. You could be, you could be a radical if you want, but you can also be a complete conservative and think that openness makes sense for information. The second is ta power dynamics. And I've said it on the example of bread, but the dynamics of power. The problem is this, and it's very simple. On the right, if you actually added them up, those dots on the right are bigger than the circle on the left. Right? If, you, if they all came together, they would be bigger than on the left. But if the big circle on the left had to fight the, the little, those little guys on the right, who would win? The big guy, even though he's overall smaller. So what goes on in this area is take like pharmaceutical industry. It might be better that we move to this open innovation model right now. But the pharmaceutical industry make really quite big profits like really very big profits. And even leaving aside the profits, they have like really, really big companies with lots of people employed, and it's really nice running, like if you run a really big company, you get a really big salary and you get like really big bonuses, right? You know, it's not so attractive if the pharmaceutical industry were more like, I don't know, what would like, what we think of like, I don't know, the ice cream industry is a bad example, but if you think of industries that are really competitive, they might be really dynamic, like the airline industry. The airline industry never really makes lots of money. It's really competitive. It's got lots of different people who compete in it. If you look at the airline industry, you never want to invest in the airline industry. The airline industry never makes money, right? The pharmaceutical industry makes lots of money. And so the issue is of power, which is, yes, it would be great to move to a different system, but it can be hard because there are people who would lose out and they're very concentrated. They're not just lots of people. They're like, there's only like eight really, I don't know, I'm trying to count the number, but there's like four massive record labels. There are like eight massive pharmaceutical companies or whatever. They're very concentrated power. There is a way to overcome that, but that's why it's hard. That's why we're not there already, right? So, and even worse than that, if we don't do anything, dystopia is the default. It's not only that things won't get better, they'll get worse. We'll end up with a world of incredible closed information where monopoly rights everywhere, they last forever, they're et cetera, et cetera. That's the risk. And it's because of the gravity of power. If you already have proprietary rights, if you already have monopoly rights, you want more of them or you want them for longer. Okay, so we must act. That is a crucial point of this. We must act. It is not, the internet will not save us. We cannot just allow technology to run on and it will magically produce the promised land. Sadly, also, just on its own, democracy won't resolve this for us. And I want to end by saying there are two ways we can do this. To go back to those models, we need to collect money. Information goods, I sound a bit abstract, but like music or medicines are very like public goods like defense. Everyone can have access to the, na to, you know, the use of national defense, like the army or the police, right? They benefit everyone. The police don't go, ooh, you didn't pay for the police. Someone broke your house, I'm not going to deal with it. That, people did try that model, but it's not very efficient, right? Or the fire service. In ancient Rome, they would literally turn up at your, your house and say, your house is burning down, do you want to pay us or not? No? Okay, your house is going to burn down, right? Crassus got very rich that way. So we need the state, because that's the, that's the entity that's out there that can collect money for all of us in a way that's really effective and, and then help distribute it, sort it out. But that takes us, we need the state to go and change the rules. And that means we need to go out there and we need to take political action. We need to go and engage in advocacy and we need to have the state implement an open model. That's what we need them to go do. And it's a classic public good problem and that's what we want to do. And then the bottom up option is we go and build stuff ourselves. We don't wait for the state. We go and build open source software and we go and build open databases and we go and build open um, uh, music or whatever it is. And that's a great idea too. And we could even create cooperatives for funding and access. Rather than having Spotify built by a proprietary VC-funded semi-monopolist, 
we could do Spotify ourselves in a way. We could get together and collectively license music and then share it among ourselves. Quite difficult, it's possible. The thing is, I just want to emphasize that the bottom-up is not enough. In general, this bottom-up option, it might be very attractive and we should definitely do it, but it won't cut the mustard. If you really look at it, in general, we can't contract, create op enough software just through our own bottom-up labors and our spare time and selling services, rather, selling consultancy and giving, like, allowing the software to be open. It doesn't cut it. If you look at most major information goods, someone, if they are open, it's because the state took a role in funding them normally in quite a significant way. There's no route around having the state get involved in this in some way, normally unless we get really good at building cooperatives. So, we do need concerted political action. And finally, the rules must change. We need advocacy, activism, and we need politics. And that is why I'm here today with you, because we can create this heaven and avoid the hell, if you like. We can create the utopia rather than the dystopia. And I really mean that. I don't think we've imagined what it's like, we can conceive of what it's like in a world where the majority of what we're making is like this and it's shared in this way. It could really be incredible. And that's also why open knowledge exists. We need to build, you know, to build a movement, you need organizations and that's what open knowledge is engaged in doing. So if you're interested in getting involved in that kind of activism or that advocacy or even that bottom up work, there are many other wonderful things to do as well, but open knowledge is doing exactly that. And so you should join us. So we need to create an open information. We are making open information. I have a faith that is ultimately so compelling that it will be realized in our lifetime. And I say that, you know, if you went back to 1970 and you looked at environmental movement, it had exactly the same problems. Do you remember the big circle and all those little circles? The little circles are the people whose rivers are being polluted. They're all of us when the climate change happens. And the big circle is like an oil company. They've got a big interest in continuing to drill oil and emit it. We haven't, now it may be, you may say the environmental movement hasn't done great, but it's not done badly if you think of where you were in 1970. 1970 would have seemed hopeless, hopeless. And yet it's made a real difference. And in a very positive way, by the way. And similarly here, I have hope. We do need to get together in a more organized way and make, to make a difference. But I am very hopeful because the benefits of an open model are so great. To leave you just with a number, it's estimated that Americans spend in last year $374 billion buying prescription drugs. And that resulted in $100 billion of R&D, half of which was done by the government. The $374 billion spent on drugs 50 billion dollars of R&D by the industry. That is a very, very bad trade-off. That's a lot of money that we could just use for other good things if you sorted that model out. Going back to our diagram of the pills, okay? So we can and should create this world and I ask you, my invitation is to come and join in. Thank you very much.